Today I'm continuing with my Struggling Calathea series and we are on plant four in the series. The first was my Calathea Mokoyana, the second was my Calathea Zebrina, the third was my Calathea Medallion version two, and you can see what it looks like right now. I just repotted this and cleaned this plant up last week and it's already got some new growth, so that's really exciting. And today plant four is my Calathea Varshavitsiae. I don't know if I'm saying that right. I, you might recognize this Calathea Varshavitsiae from another video. This Calathea absolutely did survive what happened to it when the soil compacted and it wasn't getting enough oxygen to the roots. So as you know, this plant has really been through it. My Calathea Varshavitsiae I've had for probably about three years now. It is one of my absolutely favorite plants. It's beautiful. It is kind of a velvet leafed Calathea, number one. And number two, it has this patterning on the leaves of these kind of two different really beautiful tones of green and then a very beautiful aubergine backing to the leaf. Now, my Calathea Varshavitsiae has done something that was a little bit surprising to me, but only not because of the age of the plant, but because of some of the things the plant has been through. And that is that it's grown this sort of second tier, this really long petiole, where it's starting to have kind of two layers of growth. And this isn't uncommon with a number of Calathea. This is that stage of maturity that they get to. And a lot of Calathea do grow to be between two, two and a half, three feet tall. And I always say when I get my Calathea, oh, how lucky I am to watch it grow and it's gonna mature in my house. And then I'm like, what was I thinking? Because I have no place to put this two foot plant. Regardless, my <laughs> Varshavitsia is wonderful. And I really have been dreading doing anything with this plant because it's one of the plants that I suspected was dealing with either a bacterial or a fungal issue. So before I get really too into anything, you'll see me put on some gloves just to be safe. Oh, what's really wrong with it? Aside from the fact that I was afraid it was having a fungal or a bacterial infection. Well, I'm gonna rule both of those out because one, the plants really started to recover and two, a lot of times these can be kind of lethal, especially if you don't do a quicker intervention. So it definitely didn't seem to be that. And it made me feel more comfortable sort of letting the plant continue to heal itself instead of jumping in because it did start to look better and better. It does still have a little bit of yellowing on the leaves that we'll get to. Um, it also has a couple of leaves where you can still see where it started and kind of seem to stop. And then there's some white speckling on the back of the leaves and that beautiful kind of aubergine color on the back makes it really easy to see and spot this white speckling. So let's just start there. We, we need to get all of these dead leaves that you see. These leaves accumulated over time, but also in a kind of short period of time, the plant died back a lot. Originally, there were three major pieces to this plant. Two died completely back to the soil. And you can see now they're just kind of these stubs sticking up out of the pot. The plant's really off center and the new growth, it does have this new piece of new growth, but as you can see, it's really at the edge of the pot. And this is the thing about Calatheas and how they grow uh, new growth. How, how does that actually happen? It's those rhizomes that are spreading out horizontally under the surface of the soil. And so if there's not room in the pot for this to happen, it can make you know actually cultivating new growth really difficult. So one thing I know I wanna to try to do is we're going to repot this plant, but I also want to make sure that when we do, I can kind of center the existing growth that's above the soil and see if we can't give it a little bit more room on the sides to produce more growth. But what about this white speckling? I definitely need to clean the leaves off. The, this plant's actually been on the floor and the cats love this plant. They rub all over this plant. Uh, they sniff this plant. They really enjoy sitting by this plant. Uh, the cats love this plant. It makes me really glad that Calathea are non-toxic to cats because my cats just can't stay away. So, okay. I'm looking at the back of the leaves and what I suspect happened with the plant, aside from that initial worry I had a bacterial or a fungal infection in the soil, is maybe... Well, it's not spider mites. Now, of course, I first thought this was going to be spider mites, but it, these are actually small crystals on the backs of the leaves. And I think what might've happened to this 
Varsha Vitsii is edema. Now, I was hoping all along it was edema, and I've mentioned a few times one of the main issues with the plant room that kind of really threw my collection into this sort of state of chaos was too much humidity. I know calatheas are often associated with not getting enough humidity, but they absolutely can also get too much humidity. And so if you can imagine a calathea living in a space where there is air circulation, but at the same time, there's so much humidity happening that the soil never really dries out completely. And maybe the plant is getting irregularly watered. So every once in a while, it's drying out way too much, but it's still getting a lot of humidity all of the time to the point where the leaves have trouble drying out. And as you know, one of the things that plants do is they do express, right, uh, this kind of liquid through their tissue, and you see it show up, little beads of liquid at the you know tip of a leaf. Well, they also, they when the, it's so humid out, they, they can't do that, and they kind of just stay trapped, and then they kind of pop these crystals out. Another thing that could cause crystals would be maybe over fertilization. And I wondered about that because of some of the yellowing and the browning, but the placement of it is different, which is what made me think of an infection. So I think though what it actually is, is edema and edema, it not only has these kind of symptoms where you see these white crystals on the backs of leaves, but also you see this yellowing and the browning this kind of spotting on the surface of the leaf. And thankfully, unlike an infection, um, I don't have to worry about it spreading. I don't have to worry about it killing the plant. It's not any type of real illness. It's really the result of how the plant's being treated. And one reason why this plant has been able to recover is because I brought it out of the plant room. And what that did is it immediately reduced uh, the humidity. It wasn't so close and near to other plants, which also, right, that raises humidity levels as well. Uh, you know, edema also has something to do when you have plants sometimes clustered too tightly together. But it was really able to correct itself to the point where it's grown into a new stage of maturity and it's also putting out other new growth here in the growing season. So I'm feeling really good. Uh, what we need to do next though is look at the roots. How tightly compacted is this plant in the pot? Now I often get accused of using pots that are too large. They usually work for me. In this case, the pot for this plant might have been a little bit snug. And I think it definitely was because you can see that this is a heavily rooted plant and it's really compact here at the root ball. And I definitely want, and I think it's a good idea to move into the 10 inch pot, like I said. This plant's gonna need room for these roots to grow into new soil. I am not, I'm kind of pausing, I'm kind of hesitating as I'm saying this. I'm not gonna break up the root ball. It is tempting to get rid of this old soil because I have this knee jerk concern still that was it a soil issue? Is there bacterial? Is there is there a fungus in here that's causing the problem? And it's not. I know it's not the plant recovered. Um, it's looking good. I, I know it was very likely edema, but it's still that really wanting to get rid of this old soil, but I'm just gonna leave it. I'm gonna let it go. I'm not breaking up this root ball. I'm not gonna stress this plant out any more than I already have. So we're just gonna repot, we're gonna pot up. And I'm gonna get this plant centered into a 10 inch pot. And then I'm just gonna dump the soil in. I'm just gonna pour it in. It's rare that I get to do that because, you know, usually I'm dealing with a smaller pot and it would just make a huge mess, but this is perfect. Do not inhale when you see like a sort of whitish cloud rise up out of this type of movement in the soil, especially when you've done what I've done and amended it with a ton of perlite. This is abrasive, do not breathe it in. I got a small inhale of it on accident and it just immediately made me cough. And of course, once that's done, I had to go find a water tray and the first one, I don't know what I was thinking, definitely didn't fit. So I found a second one out in my plant shed, rinsed it off, brought it in, and it works perfectly. Now it's time to water the plant. And of course, anytime you repot, you want to water. Even though I just watered yesterday, this plant really is, soaks up water. And I mean, look at all of the roots that it had. So it really soaked up the water and I do want to provide it with some fresh water. This is really dry soil that I'm adding. 
Of course, I use distilled water with my plants. I distill it myself. And that's one also reason I kind of suspect edema with the plant and that these aren't salt deposits or fertilizer deposits on the back of the leaves because I do distill my own water. So I know that there hasn't been any sort of salt treatment to the water, like a water softener. The only process that the water's been through really is this distillation process that I do here at home. Now, again, this plant has been sitting on the floor by a window, but on the floor and I'm gonna put it back into an actual plant holder that's gonna lift it up off the ground a little bit. I'm sort of rearranging a living space that I have to kind of do more than what I've done with all of my calathea, which is kind of just dump them onto these shelving units clustered around a very large window. I'm, I'm gonna try to make it a more um, attractive space. These are attractive plants as I'm starting to really help them sort of look physically better. What I'm thinking is that uh, this space is going to feel better that they're in and I'm going to make it more of a livable space where I can spend a lot more time with them. I also want to share something I kind of went through and I'm going through through this process of the series, which is that I have been, if I'm honest, as you know, I expressed a lot of anxiety around fiddling with my Makoyana, my Sabrina. Um, I was really afraid I killed those plants. Uh, not so much with the medallion version too, but the Varshavitsia I really put off because I I don't know why. It, it was just a little bit harder with this plant and because I think that I was holding a lot of these memories or these feelings of, oh gosh, I have some type of infection that's going to be spreading around my plants and killing all of them and it's too late and there's nothing I can do. So there was these kind of feelings that I just really didn't want to do anything with the plant. But then I look at the plant, I dust it off a little bit, I clean the leaves, I um, I pot it up, I get rid of the, the growth that died. I look at the plant in its totality in the way that it looks today. And I'm forced to kind of rethink how I think about my Calathea collection. Often when people come to my channel, it's because usually they're looking for some type of um, answer to whatever is happening with their Calathea. Usually it's because it's not because things are going good, it's usually because things are going bad, except for there are some people who come who are like me, just collectors who, you know, you like to look at other people's collections. But for the people who uh, come because there's something wrong, one of the things that I just wanna share, and again, is inspired just through doing this series and dealing with some of the plants I was more afraid to deal with, is that Calathea are a lot more resilient than we give them credit for often, kind of in the plant community. They're often known as being really fussy and dramatic and hard to keep alive. Um, yes and no. I would say that the whenever something happens, they tend to look dramatic. If there's something wrong with the plant, you know right away. And at the same time, they really can bounce back. Now I've showed you plants where They've looked really bad at certain points. I've showed you plants that have died almost completely back. I've showed you, um, and I'll show you more plants, like the plants I imported that I showed, they had died completely back to the soil. I've regrown a number of Calathea from the rhizome now because um, of a variety of reasons actually. But what I wanna say is, again, I think they're a lot more resilient than we give them credit for. They definitely do take a little bit more care maybe than the average plant, but my ideas around whether or not they're fragile have really changed because overall my plants have been incredibly resilient. I think there's also this expectation that plants should always look perfect. But the thing is that if you go to a botanical garden or you actually see, say, a photo of a calathea in its natural environment, they never look perfect. In the most ideal conditions, they never look perfect. They're in this constant state of growth of leaves dying back, of browning, of spots showing up, maybe a little bit of wilting. These things go on. They're not necessarily unnatural at all. Obviously, that growth process is the most natural thing. So while I know that it sometimes can be hard to see Calatheas go through things, I think they're a lot stronger than we give them credit for. And that's something I'm learning more and more about my collection as we go. Especially this time of year, it's really inspiring because Calathea all over my house are starting to flower and it's just a really beautiful time of year for them. And when the winter comes, it's going to be different and I, that's okay too. So I'm very pleased to share the progress of my Calathea Varshavitsiae with you. So this is 
number four, plant four in the series done. There will be another plant next week. Until then, be well and take care.